This is Into the Absurd, episode number 10 with Tristan Morehouse, my roommate. Today we're going to discuss a little bit about stoicism, maybe going into some other philosophies, you know, stuff like that. Um, so Tristan, stoicism. You, I've noticed that since I've known you, you kind of walk the earth as a stoic i like to think so in a way yeah i mean it's more recent years i would say in the last since um probably 2017 is kind of when i read meditations for the first time and since then it's just kind of oh it's really grown on me uh, like especially looking at like Marcus Aurelius and his time as emperor and like all the stuff he lived through. It's like, no wonder he was a stoic. He's just like, yeah, some days it is what it is. Yeah. So, but I don't know. I think it's a good philosophy to have in today's day and age, especially with everything going on. You know, there's so much that you can control, but at the same time that there's so much that you can't. So why let the things that you can't bother you? I feel like a lot of people nowadays let too much get to them over things that they can't control. And stoicism is big about, you know, controlling what you can control and not worrying about the rest. Mm. Tending to the part of the garden that you can touch. Yeah, exactly. You know, pulling the weeds where you can, um, helping grow the plants where you can, watering the soil, doing all that. But, you know, the things you can't control, like when it rains, if the sun is out, you can't control that. Why worry about it? Do what you can do to maintain a healthy garden let the elements that are going to do what they're going to do on the outside do whatever they're going to do. Yeah, I think with uh, with that, it's also about, I noticed that there's a lot about patience. Yeah. I think patience plays a part in it. I didn't have patience when I was younger. So it's definitely something that's like grown on me as well as I've gotten older. I notice that I'm a lot more patient with things. I mean, I think it's just part of the letting go of, I think patience comes with just kind of letting go, letting go of the fact that you realize you can't control certain things like waiting in line. You know, people get frustrated with that and it's like, well, I can't control the weight. And since I can't control it, I should try and occupy myself with something else. You know, I think that's where I find patience with things is mm -hmm. in that time where I'm stuck in line or stuck waiting for food or something like that. Instead of being irritated by the wait, I find something else. Maybe I'll play some chess on, on my phone or mm -hmm. something random like that, occupy my time. And I think that's kind of where the patience comes from is being comfortable. I think patience also just comes with being comfortable with who you are, with, you know, not being occupied with an activity, but being okay with just sitting there with your own thoughts, waiting for whatever it is to happen next. You know, I think a lot of people don't feel comfortable with their own thoughts. Yeah, and, you know, when you're sitting in line, a thing that you can do to be patient is kind of introspect and reflect on your own thoughts and sit with them a little bit you know instead of being like oh i have to sit in this line for an hour this sucks my life is terrible you could be like well what's going on in my life what have i been doing um, what why am i so negative about standing here and having the privilege to breathe as a living being living in existence yeah i totally agree with that i mean to go right off of that like why you can sit there and self-reflect why why am i so negative right now like what in my life is causing me to be this way because you know a normal person wouldn't feel angry or negative necessarily about this situation why am i feeling that way what in what other factor in my life is causing me to have this strife you know I think it I think it plays into that too big time. And then you grew up on a ranch, right? Sort of. Um we grew up in the middle pretty much in the middle of nowhere. 
and we were surrounded by everybody that had big ranches, fields, and then we had five acres, and we ran horses on the five acres, trained everybody's horses around there, um, and then I would just work on the surrounding ranches, so I didn't necessarily live on one, but I mean, I basically grew up on one working there, and then all my friends, close friends, owned, you know, property out there, and ran cows, and farmed, and so I'd spend a lot of time on their property, and working their farms and ranches with them, and then, of course, just hanging out, doing the old stupid country boy stuff, but, yeah, grew up there, and then moved out at, you know, 18, got out of the town, moved away, moved to um, Tri-Cities for a little while over in Spokane, or not Spokane, Tri-Cities over in Washington, um, lived there for about six months, and then I moved up to Spokane. After about eight months in Spokane, went down to Alabama for three months, and then went over to Seattle for the next few years, lived over there, um, worked, and kind of just hang, hung out, you know, lived life. And the entire time I was bouncing around, you know, I was making different life decisions, making good ones, bad ones, kind of really coming to age with who I was. That was a big, that was, that was fun. Yeah, you know, I had good memories of it all. It was crazy times. Looking back, I'd probably do a few things different. But yeah, and then I got to Moscow like three, four years ago. But yeah, and I think I think that's part of where I am a stoic too. Is like my upbringing, you know, divorced parents, all that. Things happen in life. You're always angry about it, but you're angry at the fact that you have no control over it. And so it's like at one point in time you have to come to come to terms with the fact that you don't have control over it and let that anger go. And when you do, I think it's easier to relate that into other areas of life as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you finally go, you know, oh, I just got to shrug it off. Mm-hmm. Why am I letting it bother me? Nothing I had control over. Mm-hmm. You know. Because you can't control your thoughts. Exactly. You can control how you think. You control how you see the world. You can control how you see situations. I mean, I think it's also good to talk to yourself, honestly. I think it's good to have a good relationship with yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, it's okay to call yourself a silly goof if you put coffee in wrong or something like that. You know, it's just a simple mistake. Oh, you goofed up. Big deal. No worries. Yeah. I think that helps to let go of a lot of problems and things as well as by having that internal conversation of, hey, oh, it happened. Eh, it happens to everybody. I keep on moving on. Yeah, and there, cause there's always just those situations that you find yourself in where, oh, shoot, like, why did that happen to me? That was so dumb. You know, like when I went to Winco the other day and I got, I saw this, 24 pack of Corona light or Corona <laughs> extra. <laughs> and I was like, Oh God, it's, it's only 20 bucks for a 24 pack. Wow. I'm, I'm getting that. So I, I go and I buy it and I come home and then I ask you, Hey man, you want a beer? I got a, I got a 24 pack for 20 bucks, man. <laughs> I was really excited. I open up the box and I pull it down there. Seven ounces. <laughs> Mini Not beers. the size, but there wasn't anything I could do about it. It's my fault. I didn't look at the package. So. But I mean, we're drinking them now, and they're great, aren't they? There's nothing wrong with them. <laughs> yeah. No, I love Corona. No, uh, I knew a good friend of my dad, Scott. He always has Coronas. I guess. Oh, it's it's called Corona Ita. I didn't even notice that. Coronita. Corona Ita. Because in, in Spanish, they add an ita at the end if it's something small. Oh. I wonder if the box said that as well. I bet it did. It, it probably did. <laughs> so it, it's just a simple misunderstanding of language, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Speaking of Spanish, you, so, you, uh, so you know a little Italian, right? I mean, a tiny bit. Definitely, tiny bit. definitely lost... Lost more than I know now. That's for sure. I used to know more and lost most of it. I mean, I can remember like two to three phrases. Not good phrases either. (laughs) (laughs) 
I mean, you know, you can ask people to do this or that, but yeah, no, I, I, I wish I would have stuck with it. I think Spanish is one I wish I would really took up when I was younger because now I find myself off and on picking it up here and there and then dropping it, picking it up. Mm. And I think having a second language is valuable I think, to anybody, especially because they say after you learn three languages, it's really easy to learn language, any type of language after that. You just picked up on it, and if you've already got two, what's one more? If you've got three, why not go for four? Yeah, and um, Spanish is just, it's a beautiful language. Oh, I, I love hearing people speak Spanish, I really do. Spanish and Italian, I think I love listening to it. The way it flows, it's so, it's so fast, but it's like, there's just so much information with it too it feels like a lot of the time but then at the same time there's phrases where it's really long and it's like two words mm -hmm. i just yeah I, I love it the way it sounds the accents to it it's a beautiful language i do agree did you ever see the roman Colosseum? yeah i mean uh me and a good friend actually joe got to take a full tour of it inside and out self self-led tour i should say <laughs> Because we just kind of ran around, didn't know where we were going. But it was it was amazing. I kind of, they say, you know, what, 10,000 people could fit in it? And seeing it, I mean, it felt, I bet they were crammed in there. Is the, um, is the Sistine Chapel in Italy? Yeah, it's in the Vatican. The Sistine Chapel is Vatican. In, in the Pope um, in Rome, in the Vatican in Rome. Um, you know, I saw it. And when I, f I thought it was going to be a lot bigger than it was, mm. I was, I definitely had the impression that it was going to be a much, much bigger than it was, but nonetheless, I mean, it was like, it was beautiful. It was impressive to see, especially cause it's something you read about in history books and you know, you hear tales about this and that Michelangelo, all these great artists that lived in that time. And then when you go to Rome, you actually get to see all these different artworks of all these different artists. Mm. And same when you go to Florence or Pisa, you get to see all these artworks and just the beauty of everything. And it's, I mean, it was really a, t a different time back then. I think people actually, not, and not to discredit today's people, but I think they just put a, a real touch on things. Like it really meant something to them to put a building somewhere like it mm. had to make sense especially if it was a shrine or something and it had to have color it had to be nothing could be an eyesore it seems like and they took that into account with everything it was all about leisure all about the people just being surrounded by this luxury it seemed like it was and you know i think i think that was just amazing mm -hmm. and because because right now a lot of those uh, those marble structures are corroded but to see all that stuff in their prime, you know, to see Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel painting on the ceiling right after he was done with it, that would have been spectacular. Oh, I totally agree. It would have been, uh, yeah, I totally agree. It's, um, there's a guy who does a podcast. Um, his name is slipping my mind right now. Dan Carlin. Yeah, Dan Carlin. Yeah, does hardcore history. He brings up the point that he would love to take a hot air balloon and fly over like ancient battlefields and ancient civilizations to just observe. And I totally agree with that. I think it would be amazing to have the experience to just in a hot air balloon float over these places and look down and really see how people lived, see how the culture was and all over the world. Like go back and really see what the Persian Empire was about because mm -hmm. through war and bombing and all that in modern age, a lot of it's been ruined. And then through war and, you know, destruction throughout the ages as well, it's been ruined. And it's like you hear these tales of these great buildings that stood and it's like, man, what would it have been like to see those buildings? Not only that, like watching people build them in that time, that age, seeing that happen, it would be just mesmerizing i mean it's an experience you couldn't beat so what was it like walking amongst the land of the stoics in italy intoxicating i was drinking a lot <laughs> i found that, that was a big thing you know you gotta have wine with every 
every meal almost. Maybe except for breakfast, but even then it's like, oh, have a shot of coffee and then a glass of wine. Did you go to any other countries while you were studying abroad? Yeah, uh, me and my friend Joe, we traveled quite a bit. I was pretty lucky because he was a cool guy and he wanted to travel quite a bit as well. And so we got to hit a lot of places. Um, and I, I think that's the biggest thing too, I will say, if you're going to travel, the biggest thing, if you're going to travel with somebody is finding somebody that is very much into the same kind of travel style mm. that you're into it makes things just way fun way more fun because mm. um, there's definitely different kinds of travel styles some people like to go out and hang out on the beach all day and do nothing and some people like to see everything exactly you know some people want to go back at noon and take a nap for an hour and so if you find somebody with the same style it, it's really nice and you know he had a very similar style, and so we traveled a lot. And like we went to, we went to England. We got to go to um, Croatia. We went to Norway. No, we didn't. We went to Sweden, and then we went. To, yeah, we did. We went to Norway, and then we went to Denmark as well. Um, Where did all you go to Norway? Oh no, actually we canceled Norway, never mind, because we were going to go to Oslo in Norway, and then we canceled it because when we were in Spain, we got robbed, <laughs> and we had to um, buy new passports at the embassy because we were robbed of ours, and then we had to buy different plane tickets and stuff like that, and so we ended up actually cutting Oslo out, that's right, so we ended up not going to Norway, but we went to Malmo, and... Um, well, we went through Malmo in Sweden up to, oh, it's, the name of the town is escaping me and it's, I can't pronounce for the life of me. You went to some cool, some cool place in Sweden. Yeah, it's the second, it's the second biggest city because it's on the other side because there's Stockholm, right? Stockholm is on the east side of Sweden. I'm not very geographically inclined but okay. i trust your opinion i, th I think it is <laughs> if i'm thinking i'm pretty sure it is but i could be wrong so don't quote me but um it's on the west side of the country but i mean it's it was gorgeous i mean all of sweden was just beautiful we took a bus through it and it was just i mean it, the mountains the woods everything was just beautiful same with denmark i mean everything there it was just, it was everything about it was beautiful, you know. The buildings were beautiful, all the people were beautiful, um, you know, the culture, everything was, everybody was so welcoming too. That was the biggest thing that surprised me the most about traveling everywhere, is everybody everywhere I went, there were people that were welcoming to you. You know, they wanted to show you things, they wanted to invite you in, they wanted to cook for you, and it was just such a warming experience, you know, especially growing up in the U.S. It seems like everybody always tells you that, oh, Europeans hate us, and you always have this stigmatism about it, you know, oh, Americans, and you get over there and you find out, oh, these people don't really believe in that. It's just the stereotype, and, you know, we should all be smart enough not to believe in stereotypes, and they're, yeah. you know, it, everybody's the same around the world, mm. like, no, definitely. You say you put it, you know, sit across from anybody for five minutes, you can come up with something to talk about. There's some common ground. Everybody's got hardships, everybody's got stuff going on. And I think, you know, in today's day and age, social media and all that puts so much spin on real life and what's really happening mm. in the world that people just can't see that. That's why I think you should, everybody should travel. Yeah, I think um, with that soul. social media, it kind, of, it kind of alienates you from reality. Yeah. In a sense. And, you know, when you're just surrounded by your own bubble with people that think the same, you know, like, if you're in a bubble of Democrats, you know, you'll think like a Democrat. If you're in a bubble of Republicans, you'll think like a Republican. Or if you're in a bubble of just Americans or people from your hometown, you're going to think like, Americans and people from your hometown, but if you go overseas and you see what these people are doing, what they're thinking, then you see, oh, there's another way to see things, and we have some common ground, and that's nice. Yeah, 
Yeah. And I mean, like your parents probably, and your grandparents especially being immigrants, you know, they they are probably very open-minded and seeing that that's probably as well why it makes sense like you're a very generous person so are they they're very welcoming and it makes sense you know seeing that they're immigrants from because your family's from what norway right yeah my grandfather's from norway right he, uh, he came here right after world war Two. yeah and so with you guys being immigrants you know you you understand different cultures you understand what it's mm-hmm. like to move somewhere new and see oh you know things are different in terms of you know culture but people are still just as welcoming just as loving still have hardships the same as you do and i think they teach that you know throughout their families you know Mm -hmm. that you still have to be generous like that they bring their culture with them which is one reason why i think the united states is amazing is because of the fact that you know anybody can move here or at least you'd hope yeah, <laughs> you know, I would hope anybody could. It's not a reality, unfortunately. But um, all the culture everybody brings, I think, just adds to what makes the United States so amazing because mm-hmm. it's like traveling the world, but you're just within one country. But yeah. you get to see, you know, how people live because they mm-hmm. move here, but they bring their culture with them, and it's just yeah. Oh, I mean, I you think. go to China, and it's just Chinese people. There's just one, there's just one culture and, you know, don't get me wrong. It's beautiful to see. It's amazing, but it's like, it's such a melting pot here that not only do you get that old traditional culture in certain areas, but then you get that new mix with modern era and all the social media culture mixing in with like old culture or, Mm -hmm. you know, all these different, a mixing pot essentially. And it just creates something that you can't really find. It's hard to find elsewhere. I think that's one thing that makes it, you know, so great. Yeah, I mean, I went to uh, I went to Norway in 2015 with my mom and sister, and my uh, I guess my cousin or my grandfather's sis- sister's daughter's husband. He made us a bunch of steaks and it was delicious and we stayed at their house and it was amazing mm-hmm. beautiful right by a lake he took me and my cousin fishing and it was i just had a grand time and just them showing us their hospitality even though you know we, we've never even met them never even met them let let us stay in their home for a night and made us like a whole buffet of food yeah, dude. No, I totally agree. I can remember countless times where, like, I went out to a Aperitivo with some friends to get drinks and this and that. Um, we're getting drinks and food. Next thing you know, we run into some Italians, and they're chit-chatting with us. And next thing we know, we're back at their apartment, you know, having more drinks. And all of a sudden, we're going to the club together. And it's like, we just met these people a few hours ago. But they're like, oh, you guys are, you know, you're new in town? All right, we're going to show you, we're going to show you a good time. And it's like, Sweet. I mean, looking back, at any point in time, we probably could have been kidnapped or killed. Thank God we weren't. But it was, you know, it was just, it was fun. And it was, everybody was so warming and welcoming. You just kind of trusted them to say, mm-hmm. all right, that's fine. But now yeah, I can remember countless times where that would happen. I mean, you can talk about anything, too. I think the funniest thing is talking politics over there. Just because it's so fun. They're, especially because you're always believed to that they, to think that they believe well this or that and then when you actually get to hear their opinions because they're real people it's uh it's interesting to hear mm-hmm. yeah i was surprised to hear certain things here and there i won't say what they are just because politics is not a fun topic <laughs> but no i enjoyed it a lot and i you know i can't wait to do it again yeah no i um I think traveling is an important thing in life. You know, I'm going to have this, uh, or at least my uncle and my dad, they own this, this river property out, the St. Joe, and it's, it's beautiful. And, and this one time I was, I was out there with my friends and, and we were talking about how, oh, we want to go to all these places. And then later on we were sitting by the fire and, and my uncle's buddy tells me, you know, you guys are 
talking about going to all these places, but right here is the best place on earth. And I was thinking, you know, at one point, it's it's important to be happy with what you have, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, he's right. The St. Joe, you, you've been there, right? Yeah, I've been to the St. Joe it's, River. It's one of the most beautiful places it's gorgeous. On earth. Yeah. But you also have to travel other places and see what it's like too. Just to be more well-rounded and realize, oh, the whole world isn't right here. There's more stuff going on. You can explore the whole planet. And there's beauty everywhere. Mm -hmm. you, you've just only seen one. You've only seen one thing that's breathtaking. So you continue to go back to that one thing. But if you branch out, say you go to the Grand Canyon, you're going to go, wow, this is the most beautiful place in the world. But then say you go to a national park over in Europe and you see some waterfalls and you go, wow, this is, you know, I think it's all about perspective. There's beautiful places everywhere. You can find them anywhere. I think you can find them, you know, in a city. I think you can find them in a suburb. I think you can find them in the woods, the mountains. I, I think if you look in the right spots, you can find beautiful things everywhere. I mean, what's, you know, you look at a nice neighborhood every now and again. It's beautiful for what it is. Mm -hmm. But it's the same with, like, those run-down neighborhoods. Because you look at them and you can see what used to be, how it was when it was first built. You can see what used to be there. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's, in its own sense, destruction is also beautiful as well. And you can see how, through time, these things have been destroyed. And it's not necessarily... a good beauty but it's an interesting one it's almost a teaching one because you can see the potential of the beauty that is to be hold that is there but that it has the times and like the area have stripped it away almost like when you go to a, a you know run down part of town and you think back maybe 10 years and you're like, man, I remember when this place was just busy and there were cars here and people here and doing this and that. And you knew the, the beauty that it was and then it's been taken away. And it's like, you, if only we could just get that back. If only we could just bring that back somehow everywhere, you know. Yeah, there's also the inverse of that. You know, you go to places in town, you know, like in Coeur d'Alene. You know, there's some places in Coeur d'Alene that 10 years ago, no one was driving down that road. Yeah. But fast forward, there's a whole new, there's like five new businesses on that street. People are chasing down that road every single day. And it's just, you know, why can't it go back to where it was when it was kind of empty? There's a few trees. It's pretty. Exactly. But you, but, you know, you can't escape change in life. So. Yeah, well, that's like um, you've read the book Ishmael, right? Yeah, that's that goes into that. Like we are as people, we are takers. We take, mm. you know, we believe we're supposed to conquer. That's our purpose in life. But what are we really conquering? What are we really taking? You know, why is it ours? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with what with, gives us the right. Yeah, what gives us the right to, for one, destroy the planet that we live? I mean, humans right now are kind of like a person that lives in a house where they're a slob and, they're, and the house is breaking down. They're not fixing anything yeah. and, and the rent is overdue and they're about to get evicted. Yeah, because, like, I, don't get me wrong, I enjoy the life I live. I love mm -hmm. the ability to use the electronics that we get to use, and yeah. I, I love all the stuff that comes with it, but at the same time, I feel like there's also probably a more responsible way of doing it. Mm. You know, I feel like there's a more responsible way of handling these things, of taking care of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we are destroying natural beauty, and then because we've destroyed natural beauty and we've put buildings there, we then hang paintings of what used to be there in those buildings mm -hmm. to look at because it's what we've destroyed. 
Yeah, I mean, there's things in this world that... I mean, the thing is, we're not really going to destroy the planet. We're just going to destroy ourselves. Because the planet's going to keep living. Yeah, the planet's not going to die. We'll kill ourselves off before the planet does. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it'll kill us, essentially. Because there's been six mass extinction events in the history of the Earth. They say, Since life has existed. They say we're going through one right now, too, aren't they? Because well, of the rate of uh, extinct animals that have happened. Yeah, I mean, we're I mean, we're the extinction event. Yeah, essentially, we are going through and killing off. Because we've been, what, in a mass extinction since... I mean, look at the buffalo. Prime mm-hmm. example. We basically almost killed off an entire species. It kind of goes back with, with Ishmael, the... The takers coming in and just killing buffalo without even eating them. And then the then the Native Americans just being like, what are you doing? Why are you killing these buffalo? It's, it's absurd. And they're like, we need their hides. And they're like, but you can't just leave them like that and <laughs> do that. That's You have to take that. Yeah, and it's, you know, it just goes back to show too, like, Back then, certain people were starving here and there. It's like, there was no reason for it. Mm. There was such an abundance of food, if you think about all the shit they were killing. Yeah. Like, and and not only that, you know, I mean, you can you can eat pretty much mostly meat, and then you're just going to have to eat a lot of vegetables, too. You know, mm. become a good herbivore. Learn how to pick things out of the ground, off the trees and stuff like that. I but, think I heard this on, um, is either on... Oh, it was from Sex at Dawn by, by Christopher Ryan. It, it was a story about these, these British imperialists who went to Africa, and then they asked these tribal people, they said, hey, I'll, we'll show you how to farm, we'll show you how to hunt. And then they start showing them, and the, then one of the tribal people's like, um, why would we do that? There's <laughs> f- fruit everywhere in this jungle why would we spend our time working to make food when there's food everywhere we look and then they just gave up (laughs) yeah and that's exactly what yeah that's so true like in a lot of places we do that we tear down this jungle and this to build crops when it's like well you know uh there's already food there if you just knew where to look knew where to harvest yeah. They weren't so picky about your palate. Uh, mm. I think there's food everywhere, and I think that's, a, you know. I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I love living in a capitalist world where, in an agricultural society where you can go to the store and you can get anything you want. You know, there's all this diversity, there's all this culture, there's, there's everything you go, and we live in this free society where you can do whatever you want. Yeah. But before us, when we were all living in these tribes, you know, these people only worked three hours a day. Yeah, that's true. They spent th- three hours a day getting food and hunting, but, but all of this gathering food, all this hunting and gathering was you essentially hanging out with your friends and family all day, every day. Yeah, and then, I mean, that's how, that's how they began. They say, you know, people had time more time to sit and do nothing when they um they began agriculture and they began you know growing crops they say oh that's when culture started to develop because of the fact that they had the ability to um you know i guess more leisure time but i think in hunter gatherer times they had more leisure time as well but they just spent their leisure time moving to the new food a lot of the time but they were happy with that rather than just setting the food up in one spot and staying there, they would just move to the food. And I think, you know, I think that's kind of why a lot of people also like to still travel is because it's in our, it's almost in our genetics deep, deep down to always want to be on the move. Mm -hmm. Like you think about it, we're constantly like people are meant to move around or the way we walk and move. We're meant to Mm. We're not meant to just sit all day. You know, the species that's supposed to just be stagnant. Mm. Yet that's what we've become. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, back, I mean, there was a time when, well, I mean, throughout human history, there's always been this mentality of, well, what's over the horizon? What's beyond there? Is there just an edge? Does it just drop off? And then people are like, well, yeah, it just drops off. Don't go over there. You're going to fall over. And you're like, well, uh, I'm not 100% sure if I believe you. So, <laughs> you know what? I'm leaving. I'm heading over there and I'm going to go check it out myself. Yeah. And there's always been that mentality, you know, because... I mean, explorers. why did you study abroad? I wanted to explore. Yeah. I always wanted to explore. I've wanted to explore since I was a kid. I loved it. I always I always wanted to be an archaeologist when I was younger because of the fact that I would watch Indiana Jones and he'd always <laughs> get to go to these crazy exotic places and I was like, that looks cool. I can go to crazy exotic places and get paid to find historical stuff? That sounds like a dope time. Granted, I never became an archaeologist, but it sounded amazing. Found out archaeology was a little different mm-hmm. than that, but yeah, no, for real. But no, I, I think it's something that you know every kid goes through a phase. I feel like where they want to explore, you know, whether it be the city, the woods. I think everybody has that phase where they just want to be like, "What's around the next corner? What's over there? Well, I just want to mm-hmm. find something." So. To that regard, what has this um, nomadic mentality meant to you in your life in, as it pertains to your, the stoic aspects of yourself? Um, I find, I find I like moving often, actually. I enjoy traveling. I enjoy, um that somewhat nomadic lifestyle in the sense of, you know, I'll pick up and move every two or three, four years, you know, granted it depends on what I'm doing and where I'm at, but I've always enjoyed it because every time you pick up and move, it's somewhere new. It's something new, you know, and you become someone new Mm -hmm. because you're immersed into a new culture. So you begin to take on some of that culture over time. And so I feel the more you move, and the more you travel, the more you grow as a person. Because you are immersed in so many different cultures, you can understand them and you can relate with people mm. from them. And that you as a person will grow in understanding and in, you know, in everything. Mm-hmm. And so I think that is really helpful in the Stoic lifestyle because you can see the world for what it is and realize that things are what they are. And the only thing you can change and work on is yourself, really. So if you feel you need to change and work on yourself, maybe that's picking up and moving somewhere new to a different culture and changing the environment around you so Mm -hmm. that you yourself can change as well. And I think that, you know, having stoicism as a philosophy is great because it allows you to grow as a person because you're open to new Mm -hmm. experiences. Because it's like, well... I could sit here at home and do nothing, which, you know, if I do, that's the decision I make. It is what it is. I'll live with it. Or I can choose to go have drinks, and that's the decision I make, and it is what it is, and I'll live with it. And it's about making those choices and living with them. And I think having that nomadic lifestyle allows you to just make easier choices because you're constantly like, well, what's the worst that can happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, I moved to Alabama. Yeah. Nothing bad happened. I could go out tonight. <laughs> you know, people have anxiety, and I think that helps with anxiety by traveling too, because it's like, well, you know, if I can book a plane ticket, get on a plane, fly to Florida, hang out on a beach in a strange town with strangers around people I've never met, maybe two of my friends, I can give this presentation in front of this class. Yeah. You know? No problem. Yeah. I can I can do great things, you know. I can give this presentation in front of this class because I know for a fact if I want to leave tomorrow and get on a plane and go to Florida, I can. <laughs> so, and I think you know, knowing that you have those options, because once you're out of the house, you know, you pay your own bills. You can do whatever you want. Mm. It's you want to get a McFlurry on your way home. All you got to do is stop and get one. No one's stopping you. <laughs> 
you know? So yeah. you, you want to go to class? Yeah, you go to class. Don't go to class. No one's stopping you. You're an adult. Pay your own bills. Make your own choices. You want to go to Florida? Do it. You want to go to Washington? Do mm-hmm. it. Who cares? Yeah, so it kind of just makes you realize, um, for one, that, that no matter how, no matter what happens in life, you'll be okay. And for two, you're free to make your own choices whenever you want. You're free to, exactly. You're free to make your own choices whenever you want. And you'll always be okay in life if you believe you'll be okay. Mm. Because if you control your thoughts and you believe you'll be okay, you will be. You can make yourself okay. Mm. You can be super poor, but if you look at the lifestyle you have and you enjoy those things that you have, you can be fine. Mm. You can you can enjoy your life. You can live a long, happy, fulfilling life. I think the same with if you're rich. If you be if you're poor and then you get rich, you're rich and then you get poor. I think if you just understand that life is you know a fluctuation of change, and that you're just happy to be part of that change and part of that life, then you'll be okay. I mean, as long as you're alive, you're okay. And if you're at the bottom, you can only go up. That's true. So. And I mean, everyone dies, so it's not, I mean, even if you starve to death and die, it's not really that big of a deal. Yeah. And I mean, even if you're, at least you got to live, if you're at the top, it's a long way to the bottom. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, once you're there, you have nowhere to go, but up. Yeah. So as long as you believe, I think as long as you believe you'll be okay, you always will be okay. I definitely think belief is a big part of that. I mean, you've read, have you read uh, Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling? Mm, I want to say I have, but I want to say it was like a year or two ago, so I don't recall it well. It's kind of, I mean, it's a, I'm not a, I'm not a Christian by any means, but it's, uh, Kierkegaard was a Christian philosopher. And he wrote Fear and Trembling to describe um, this, this archetype called the Knight of Faith, which is resembled within Abraham, who was told by God in the Bible to go and sacrifice his son, Isaac, who was his only son and that he loved. Yeah, now the story, yep, it's coming back to me, yes. I have read it. I read it um, a, few, a few semesters ago for one of my classes. Yeah, he believed, he was a psychopath, but he believed that God was telling him to kill his son. Yeah, but it goes, so it goes a step further, um, that like, if you, like, let's say, let's just pretend for a moment that, that God is real, and that God did tell him, hey. You need to kill this guy. Yeah, you need to sacrifice your son to me to prove to me that you have faith, right? Then I'll let you, then I'll let your descendants um, rule over this piece of land as your own country, right? Mm-hmm. So and then, so and then Abraham goes, okay, I will do that, and then he keeps, keeps this hidden from Isaac, obviously. Then he goes to the land of Moriah, the Mount of Moriah, and he goes and he keeps his faith all the while. And then he goes to kill him. Then just as he's about to do it, an angel stops him, just as Abraham expected, because Abraham knew. He had this faith in him that whole time that God would not actually let his son die. He would either let him die and give him back, or he would simply just not let the death happen in the first place. And it happened. Mm-hmm. He believed and it I, would be okay. Yeah, and the yeah, he believed that it was all going to be okay. And I think if we take that story, not as, you know, a testament to have faith in God, but rather a testament to have faith in yourself and have faith in this higher um, order of things like, hey, life is going to be fine. It's all good. It's all going to be okay. Yeah. I will say I think Abraham was a ra- r- lunatic, but <laughs> yeah, I, I do agree with what you're saying there. And fear and troubling is a good way of um, looking at how that belief in yourself and believing that things will work out and having them work out, you know, is a big part of it. But I do think Abraham was smoking something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my lord. 
<laughs> but he might well have been. I mean, yeah, like at the entire time, just it's so absurd. Like, hey, man. So I know you say you believe in me, but like I'm gonna have to have you stab your kid to prove it. And you can't just do it here, though. You can't like just go stab him while he sleeps. You gotta like take him up on top of this mountain and like tie him up and put him on this altar and then stab him there for me. And it's like, okay, I'll do that. And then you hide it from your son. All the while, you're taking him up the mountain going, ah, he won't make me do it. But you're full well intentionally going up there to do it. Like, ah, he won't make me do it, but just in case, I better. Because you think about it, in the back of his head, he was probably thinking, well, if he doesn't stop me, I better do this. Yeah, well, that's kind of the whole... um... That's what being a, so he kind of compared the knight of faith to the tragic hero or the tragic hero, uh, they go and they, you know, they know that they're doing a good thing, but then something bad happens to them and then they, they perish. Right. Mm -hmm. But the, the knight of faith is different. So the knight of faith for them, they're, this is where he brings up this, this paradox where the particular becomes higher than the universal. The particular become, the particular being a man's faith, and the universal being the ethical, right? So in that moment where where Abraham had to kill Isaac, that's when his faith became more powerful than the ethical, which the ethical is the universal, right? Faith right. is the, yeah, the right. particular. It's like a madman when he's like, "I have to kill," you know, "I have to kill us and everybody in the world in order to save the world," and it's like that's ludicrous. You can't. He's a knight of faith because he believes. What he is doing is so much, so right, and the way it has to be done that it goes beyond the ethical of not killing people. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's the that, that's what the night of faith is. No, and I but the thing with Abraham though is the reason I find him also as a raging lunatic is he could have just been having an episode where he's like, oh, I'm gonna kill my son, and then he got up there and realized, oh, I don't want to do this. And so he stopped. And then people were like, why did you do that? And he goes, oh, God told me to. Yeah. <laughs> that's Because, you know, that's the thing about history. We have to assume that it's true. Yeah. But the Bible is not factual history. It is stories, oral stories passed down that were finally put into text. Well, that's the thing. I think it's um, it's know. not supposed to be taken... I don't think anything, or at least the vast majority of the things in the Bible aren't supposed to be taken literally, right? I totally agree. I think that's the problem with religion is that it is. Yeah, because, well, I don't, because I don't think it really means, oh, Abraham went up to a mountain and he killed his son for God, right? I think it's more so um, in life you should be able to, give up something and make, make sacrifices in your life so that you can fulfill your dreams. Mm -hmm. Not so much as like killing people, but maybe, you know, giving up, uh, giving up some of your vices to go out and, uh, achieve something right yeah. for a greater purpose. Yeah. Or even, um, uh, if you have a job and you know, you like your job, you're making good money and, you're having a good time, but you know, like really you want to be a writer, right? But you're, but because of the job that you work at, you just don't have time to do that. So you can make the choice to give up, um, your job and instead work at a lower paying job, you, you know, give up some of these fancy things to go and work on your passions instead, mm -hmm. because it's, it's all going to, it's all going to be okay in the end, as long as you believe in yourself, right? And uh, with Kierkegaard, you know, he was a Christian and he was religious. But what he also did was he he gave up being married to this woman to instead write and be, be a philosopher, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it um, if you take it in that light rather than the, like, fully literal, I think uh, the story really means something, at least, at least to me. I think... It, it also kind of ties into Buddhism and even Stoicism, kind of just controlling your thoughts. 
because you can control your thoughts, but you can't necessarily control everything else that is happening all around you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of things, I think, that goes into leading a happy life, too. And I think controlling your thoughts is the biggest one of them all. Because if you can control your thoughts, you really can do anything. Because if you can control your thoughts, you can quit your vices. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of overcoming that innate reaction like, oh, I want a cigarette or oh, I want that. And going, yeah, I want it, but you know what? I'm not going to do it because I have that self-control. I have that know that I can control my mind to take my mind off of it and onto something else. That's why I think, you know, it's like, yes, addiction is a bad thing. I think it is real. I think it can happen. But I also think if you genuinely want to, you can quit things. Mm -hmm. It's just you have to genuinely want it. And you have to have full control and discipline over your mind. But the problem with addiction is when you're on those drugs, you don't have that full control over your mind. Mm -hmm. So it's in those sober periods where you have to try and take that control back. But it's you got to be in yourself to want to take that control back. You know, somebody's dying of thirst and you take them to a watering hole. They can only save themselves at that point. Yeah. No, there's, there's a lot of that that you have to take into account when you're, when you're going about your day, you know, because there's, there's so many, especially today, there's just so many distractions that just pop up every which way. Yeah, <laughs> everywhere. I mean, look at billboards popping up everywhere, <laughs> distracting you when you're driving. But I mean, billboards are popping up everywhere in the sense of like, look at YouTube, it's just mm -hmm. a giant billboard for different products and things out there Yeah. for people to consume. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing I like about YouTube, though, is that a lot of times it shows you an advertisement that you might actually kind of like. Yeah, I guess. But I, I mean more YouTube as a whole, as a platform. Yeah. No, no, definitely. Yeah, because like you, it's, a, you know, it's a billboard of all kinds of things. It, it's educational it's mm -hmm. whatever you want it to be but it's no absolutely it's still a distraction you know it's yeah still no, something no, that's definitely. there on the side of the road of life it's, yeah um yeah it can be a distraction but also there's there's a lot of things that you can learn from youtube definitely yeah um, so i think uh i think the thing that differentiates a distraction from something that you're learning from is that if you're not doing something with a purpose, then it's, it's a distraction. Yeah, that's a good point. At least for most things. I mean, some things, you know, no, that's a, I mean, that is a really good point. I have never looked at it or thought of it that way. So that is a really good point. But at the same time, It could still, couldn't it still be a distraction though? Because even if it is something educational that you're trying to get a purpose with, there's still those other, there's still those advertisements like you brought up. Mm -hmm. There's still those other videos down below or, you know, subscribe to my channel to this or that. And yes, don't get me wrong. It is a great way to access information very quickly, mm -hmm. but you can also get all that information from research from books from doing things like that yeah that's true i mean we're i mean we're actively trying to distract the public right now yeah like our history is <laughs> no longer you think about it, our history isn't really being written anymore mm -hmm. it's almost being digitized it's more of yeah. a social media um history mm -hmm. than it is anything else yeah i guess um a lot of these things kind of um, alienate you from real genuine experience like for instance you know these philosophers from the past like uh, Nietzsche or Camus or, or Marcus Aurelius they they got their philosophy by seeing the world and then thinking about it you know and you know obviously occasionally reading about stuff 
But Shit, if you guys get stabbed, beheaded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and today, you know, a lot of the, the, the philosophy that we come out with is based off of things that we've already read instead of going out and experiencing something and then thinking about it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that in itself is a almost sure you're being connected to these writers who wrote about things and things that they've experienced and their thoughts on those experiences. But you're also being disconnected in the sense that you're not going out and having experiences than thinking about them on your own. Mm-hmm. But I feel like and social media is a distraction stopping you from being able to do that a lot of the time, mm-hmm. too, though, because it's like when you're, you know. When your kid's crying or upset, what do you do? Hmm. People put an electronic in front of them. And yeah. it's like, well, you know, maybe we should figure out ways to stimulate their senses in um, better ways to explore their environment around them to not just be like, oh, this is the thing that I need to, this is the thing I want. This is the entertaining thing. I need these short bursts of energy. You know, instead, let them experience the world for what it is. Think about everything that's going on. You know, don't just put a TV in front of them to shut them up. It's not doing them any good, are you? Yeah, I mean... At least that's my thoughts on it. No, I definitely think screens are a big problem right now. Just, at least just how much time people spend in front of a screen and staring at it. I mean, most jobs today are involve staring at a screen all day. It's like 90% of my job is staring at a screen. I get yeah. tired of it. It's it's hard. I mean, you're in this different kind of reality almost when you're staring at a screen all day. It's it's like this imaginary world that isn't, that's, that's kind of uh, alienated from the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or at least from real, true, genuine experience. Yeah, you, you miss a lot of the world. You miss a lot of what's mm-hmm. going on around you because you're constantly sucked into one small little square rectangle and so you don't experience your day-to-day like you think about it. It's like, oh, what what did you do today? It's like, well, I went to work. Oh, well, how was work? You know, it was good. But what did you do at work? You just stared at a screen all day. What really went on at work? Yeah. What all did you really, you know, do at work? What did you miss? Whereas, you know construction workers they're out they they see way more they always have stories to tell if you think about it they always have something to tell you about oh i saw this today i saw that today yeah you know people working in offices and doing this they don't have those because they're stuck to a screen yeah you know i can i have my experiences about every once in a while something crazy will happen but most of the time if there is i'd miss it because i'm stuck staring at a screen there's also like the way that we get our food today is also somewhat alienating. Like, cause you grew up around ranches and you actually saw the cows that you were going to eat. Right? We got our milk in the, we got our milk every Monday and every Thursday yeah. in a jug on our porch <laughs> in the morning. It was, it was delivered yeah. to us in a, in a glass jug. And then when it was done, you know, the new one came and we gave the lady the old jug back yeah i mean we had our own garden mm-hmm. we raised and killed our own beef yeah we did all that same you know we wanted we'd raise and kill a sheep chickens mm-hmm. i think you're completely right you know people are constantly saying all these things about the food industry and this and that it's like well you know if people are just a little more self-sufficient Mm-hmm. You could change a lot of those things. You know, they talk about these inhumane um, lifestyles for these animals. And I, I agree they shouldn't be put in those. I fully agree that it's inhumane. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, people can be more helpful by being more self-sufficient. Yeah. You know, instead of buying your chicken at the store, if you raise your own chickens, you can guarantee them a good life. Yeah. Yeah, you exactly. Know? You can you can take that extra care. And I, I do believe... Mm-hmm it does produce better food too. I mm. do think you can tell in the taste and all of that. Like, you know, the beef that you bring home is, is the best beef. It, it is the best beef that I've ever had in my entire life. Yeah. I, and I think a lot of, and it's like, I've always like ranch beef, grass fed beef. Like you can, I feel like you can tell there's a difference in the quality of life they have based on the taste. 
And I think that's yeah. with all animals. So mm. I think, you know, if you want to have better food and have better um, humane situations for animals, mm. you people need to be more self-sufficient. You know, yeah. it's the same with, like, people want to go green and just, you know, vegan and this and that, and it's plant-based. But when it comes to plants, you know, there's still a lot of pollution because you have to take the tractors to make the crops you know there's mm -hmm. still all of that pollution from producing crops land destruction you know you destroy environments mm -hmm. you're taking away from that as well whereas if people had their own home gardens uh, you know a little 10 by 10 plot of garden or a community garden where everybody could feed off of and work at you can reduce some of that mass farming yeah you know and I, that's why i say everybody can play a little part here and there it's just n nobody's willing to take those steps but you it's, find the people that hard. do yeah and you find the people that do take those steps tend to be happier hmm. like you come home at night and you cook up food and you're like where did this food come from i know exactly where it came from i know where this came from that came from i know yeah. who picked it you know you can guarantee all of that Mm -hmm. instead of this kind of this factory lifestyle where everything is just packaged away yeah 100 percent. i mean you know who knows how dirty the factory really is yeah that's why they say you got to wash your produce when you get it home yeah i mean a lot of the time you don't have to like carrots mm. one of the best things about eating carrots is when you eat them out of the ground you pull them out of the ground you rinse them off right well, you still don't get everything with just a rinse like that. You're not going to get everything off a carrot. But a lot of the time, because of that, you get a lot of good minerals and stuff yeah. from the dirt. And mm -hmm. it's not like it's going to kill you. I mean, a little bit is, I think, good for you because it has yeah. those minerals in it. Mm -hmm. um, it's like same with all food. Yeah. I feel like you lose a lot of that. No, you definitely do. Um I mean, those apples that my mom gave me, she told me, yeah, I'd, I'm pretty sure that the, the, the people that produce those, they encase them in this wax so that they don't go bad. It's, huh. it's an edible wax, but you know, it's, it's obviously shouldn't, you shouldn't really be eating it that well. That's why you're supposed to be washing this food really well. Yeah. And th that's the thing though. That's it's yeah. in it, like, well, if people just had an apple tree, mm-hmm. Because I don't know if you've ever had this, but like, I feel like there's a difference when I eat an apple from a tree and one from that I get from the store. I feel no, like there is. the taste of the skin is just, mm. it, it, it's different. It's from fresh. It's, mm. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think food should be so heavily processed everywhere. Yeah, well, a lot of this um, extra processing is actually just making things worse. Like, for... for for instance, pesticides and, and herbicides, uh, those damage the soil in in farms, mm -hmm. which which over time e erodes the soil and makes it a lot more dry and less nu nutrient dense. Mm -hmm. Erodes away the good topsoil and all yeah. that. I don't know if you've seen Kiss the Ground on Netflix, but it's a really informative documentary on, on why we need to change the way that we farm in order to preserve the soil and also so that we're not actually because because all these pesticides and herbicides are leading to uh health effects in in the communities where these farms are because the the herbicides and the pesticides get in their water supply mm -hmm. yeah well i think too the herbicides and the pesticides you know they try and keep the pests and all that away there's there's plants out there and bugs out there that won't eat your crops that will get rid of those things. You know, mm. I can't remember, but it's a type of gardening. I think it's holistic gardening is what it's called. Um, cause everything's connected, you know? So you mm. put plants in there that attract like ladybugs and this, yeah. that don't eat this type of plant. Yeah. They'll they eat the aphids that are eating your plant, right? Yeah, but exactly. And so yeah. they plant those along there. And then essentially the garden, you don't need those pesticides and herbicides because the garden naturally takes care of itself. Mm. And it's like there are remedies, but people don't want to deal with the process then of, yeah. oh, well, how do you harvest that? And how do you, you know, manage all that? And it's like, well, you know, that's the thing you got to figure out. That's what you got to figure out. But unfortunately, that's the way it should be done. Mm. Well, or, a lot of people I, not, live not in... unfortunately, yeah. I should say either, but that, that is the way it should be done. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, the thing is, a lot of people live in apartments. I mean, we live in an apartment. My girlfriend lives in an apartment. And it's... I mean, we can't really grow our own food, you know. Yeah. I mean, we do try. We have some basil growing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I do agree. And I think that's one of the biggest drawbacks of the apartment, honestly. I mean, I've told you numerous times I hate the fact that we don't have a patio to yeah. be able to, you know, do our own little gardening and stuff like that. Because it's yeah. something I, I think is good. Because... Even if you have a little patio, you can grow some tomato plants. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, definitely. You can grow some small things here and Strawberries. there. Strawberries. Yeah, something small enough to at least help with, the, you know, your small, mm-hmm. like our small household. There's just two of us. I think we could easily have on a patio a small garden that would sustain us both mm-hmm. a decent amount of food yeah. throughout the year, save us money and time. Yeah. I mean, and plus just the, the, the aspect of giving life to a plant and then raising it and then eating it. It's satisfying. It gives you yeah. a sense of self satisfaction in this mm-hmm. way, yeah. Well. All right, Tristan, that was um that was a good podcast. Uh thanks for coming on. Yeah, man, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I enjoy talking to you as always. Um cool. anytime you need a random guest, you know I'm here. <laughs> I'll always be here. <laughs> Well, all right, so stoicism, planting stuff in your garden, social media, traveling, um, whatever you do, just be happy. So uh, it, if you ever want to contact Into the Absurd, just email into.the.absurd.podcast at gmail.com. All right, have a good one.